Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Napoleon Bonaparte in our continuing survey of world civilizations. France is going to be seen as the nation, at least on continental Europe, that kicked off the era of revolution. Of course, you'd already had the American Revolution uh, back in starting in 1775 and then the Declaration of Independence, 1776. But now with France's revolution, that brings it much closer to home. And the other European nations are very much set against revolution because they're all being run by kings. And the idea of getting rid of your king is not something they want to catch on, have to catch on in their countries. So that France, uh, beginning with the Enlightenment, and it was Enlightenment ideals and ideas that had led to that revolution, uh, the other uh, European nations are very much entrenched in their traditionalism, especially the traditionalism of their monarchies. Uh, in France, uh, they're, they're seeking to bring about a republic. Of course, it's going to come out very differently initially, but eventually uh, you're going to see something of that republic idea, uh, just like you had had in the United States of America. Uh, other nations in Europe are still under monarchies during this period. Uh, in France, uh, the, the uh, idea is very liberal. In other words, they want change. Uh, they want to bring about this republic. Uh, the other European nations are very conservative. And the idea of conservatism is that we conserve what is there. We, we don't change anything. Um, those, those two uh, ideologies are very much set against each other. Now, Napoleon Bonaparte himself had come, uh, a young artillery officer who had come to uh, people's attention uh, when he had uh, uh, back the assembly uh, in Paris, uh, and now he gets uh, uh, permission to take his armies down to Egypt. You say, why Egypt? What's so big about Egypt? Remember that uh, uh, you have not the Suez Canal, that hasn't been dug yet, but you have uh, I, Egypt, things can be taken uh, up to that, that area and then transported a very short way overland and then to waiting ships on the other side in the Red Sea and bypass that giant uh, circumnavigation of Africa. And so Egypt is very important to everyone. And Napoleon goes and invades Egypt. And he says, I'm not here to invade. I'm here to liberate you. I'm here uh, to be your friend. And there he's going to fight uh, two major campaigns in Egypt, uh, among other things. One of the things he's going to do is he will, uh, his soldiers will find uh, a stone called the Rosetta Stone in the little uh, village of Ro Rosetta uh, near Alexandria. And it actually has, uh, uh, it has Egyptian hieroglyphs, but then in the same language, it has uh, Egyptian demotic, that is a a more recent way of writing uh, and speaking Egyptian, and also Greek. And it will be the same inscription in all three languages. And that's going to uh, give scholars uh, the key to deciphering the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Well, that's, that's a byproduct. But Napoleon fights uh, two battles, the Battle of the Pyramids, which isn't really by the pyramids, but it's you can see the pyramids from there where he fights the battle. And also the Battle of the Nile, which doesn't take place on the Nile. Actually, it takes place uh, on the Mediterranean shore just a bit uh, to the east of the Nile Delta. Um, but And uh, with the Battle of the Pyramids, Napoleon's uh, army is going to win. But with the Battle of the Nile, uh, that will be against uh, Admiral, eventually Lord Nelson, of the British and and he will lose his entire fleet uh, to that naval battle. And so that is going to strand the uh, French forces uh, there in in Egypt, which is going to mean a, a, a strategic loss for Napoleon. Well, that doesn't stop him from coming back to France uh, without his army that, that he lost uh, back there. Uh, by the way, that's also why the Rosetta Stone, although found by the French, uh, today it does not, you don't find it in France. Today you go to the British Museum in London, and that's where you'll find that, along with a great many of the other things that were found uh, by the French and yet taken over now by the English. Uh, and so the Rosetta Stone is now in England. Uh, the, the Egyptians would like to have it back, um, but I'll leave that to the diplomats and archaeologists to argue uh, on that uh, question. Uh, 
so that means that Napoleon, and he comes back to France, and he engages in a number of military um, endeavors. Uh, his endeavors by land will be uh, eminently successful. His endeavors by sea, because remember, he's an artillery officer, he's a land officer. When he fights land battles, he does very well. Um, when he sends ships out to sea, they do not go so well. And the, so it will be Napoleon's land forces against uh, England's naval forces, and that's going to pit them one against the other. Uh, the French will win by land, the, the British will win by sea. Eventually, Napoleon is going to have himself crowned as not king, uh, because remember the French uh, have now instituted, at least in paper, a republic, and republics don't have kings. Think back to the days of Julius Caesar when people were afraid he might try to make himself a king, but they were willing to let uh, Augustus, his, his adopted son, uh, the next emperor, become emperor, uh, but, but not a king. And so at the time when Napoleon is crowned emperor, uh, and remember how the, the Pope had much earlier uh, had crowned Charlemagne as emperor, as if to say, look, I put the crown on your head, I can take it off. Well, Napoleon uh, takes the crown from the hands of the Pope and he places it on his own head. And he is symbolically saying, and, and that wasn't missed by anybody, he's saying, I put the crown on my head, nobody can take it off but me. He's going to also institute some new catechisms uh, for the church, uh, that things that will be uh, that will endorse his reign, uh, because he could not uh, conquer England uh, by sea. Uh, he will seek to uh, to um, impact them by land, and he's going to institute an embargo of harbors to all British merchants. Uh, he was oftentimes heard to refer to England as a nation of shopkeepers, and so he wanted to sort of hit them where it hurt in their pocketbook. Um, so he, he places this embargo. Uh, however, the Pope, and remember, the Pope isn't just the, um, the spiritual director, he's got actually papal lands, which includes some harbors, and he re the Pope refuses to, uh, to enforce that embargo. <laughs> and so that's being short-circuited, and that puts uh, Napoleon uh, and the Pope into a conflict. Now, Pope Pius VII is captured by, Nap by Napoleon, uh, and he is in prison. Now, it's not a, a terrible imprisonment, but he, he's put in sort of a solitary confinement. Now, you have to remember that this Pope, prior to becoming Pope, had been in a monastery, had been a monk, and so it's sort of a return to his roots, and, and he takes that all in stride. Um, but while he is imprisoned, there are no new bishops being made because the Pope has to sanction any new bishops. And that means that the church is coming to a grinding halt uh, in all sorts of countries, uh, including France. But remember, France had largely gone secular. Uh, and yet there are still Christians there and there are still Roman Catholics there. And, and that has uh, next, Napoleon uh, sets out to invade Russia. This was his biggest military blunder, and he sets out and he makes he marches all the way to Moscow and captures. He does what Hitler. Remember, Hitler uh, does the same thing. Hitler sets out uh, to invade Russia and makes it within 20 miles of Moscow, and then is unable to capture the city. Um, Napoleon, by contrast, captures the city of Moscow, the capital, but. All he's captured is a city, and the the uh, uh, the Russian king is meanwhile the Russian monarch has has just left, and because Russia is a very big place, um, and and Moscow is is certainly uh, significantly into this, um, but having captured Moscow, uh, the Russians have taken a a uh, stance of scorched earth policy, where they have just burned the land and destroyed the crops. Uh, and, and Napoleon's soldiers find themselves facing starvation and a very harsh Russian winter, and he invades Russia with um, half a million men. And a tiny fraction of that amount make it back out of Russia. And he has just lost a huge, huge, huge army. <laughs> 
Back in France, uh, Napoleon now decides to settle things with the Pope, and he has an audience with the Pope. Uh, they meet for six days, and uh, when they are done, uh, he comes out and he announces, we have a concordant, we've, we've had an agreement, and uh, the Pope uh, is saying, well, that's not quite what we agreed to, uh, but Napoleon is the one who's controlling the presses, and so uh, everybody sort of goes along with that. Napoleon is finally defeated at Leipzig and uh, suffered. Now you think, well, wasn't he defeated uh, in Russia? Certainly, yes. But now it's it's not just the what it's not just the weather. He suffers a military defeat, and he retires. You know, gives up the title of emperor and retires to the island of Elba. Now his retirement, and let's look at Elba on a map. It's off the coast of Italy. Uh, he's going to be, uh, I'm not sure what title he had, prince or some sort, uh, but he gives himself a, a small title on this island uh, where it is assumed that, that he can't do any more damage. And remember, you say, well, why didn't they just capture him and put him to death? Uh, the kings don't want to have this idea of putting other kings or even emperors to death because they might be next. And so you just didn't do that in the world at that time, if you could possibly help it. Uh, of course, the revolution, the French Revolution had done that, but, but they're anti-revolution and they're anti-putting kings to death. And so begins in 1814, the Congress of Vienna. It's, uh, it's led by a uh, a man by the name of Metternich. He is the uh, assistant to the King of Austria. And this is an attempt to undo Napoleon's work. And, and some of it's just uh, too extensive to be undone. Uh, but the monarchy will be restored in France because they, uh, they want to see an end to that whole French Revolution. Uh, the Jews are returned to ghettos where Napoleon had allowed them to intermix with people. Um, and it is all an attempt to have a balance of power between the great powers. And that's going to be a, sort of a byword, a keyword, uh, a phrase that's going to continue now for the next 100 years. In fact, uh, we're going to see, um, beginning uh, with the Congress of Vienna, and of course it's going to go to June uh, 1815, we're going to see that something happens that June that, that sort of puts it on hold, but then it will come to a conclusion. It's going to bring largely a quite a large measure of peace for the next 100 years which will end when we get to World War I. Now, I'm not saying there's, there's no wars, but the wars that will take place will be relatively small and, and uh, relatively short. You're not going to have those, those long periods of war like we had had earlier in European history. And this balance of power is now going to ma be made up of Austria and Britain and Russia and Prussia, uh, with France maybe being second rate. We're going to see what something that happens to France, um, but it will eventually be one of those as well. Uh, because the King of France now is being seen as an unfortunate victim of the, of the uh, revolution and, uh, and Napoleon and that whole uh, French Revolution idea. Now, Napoleon does not stay in his self-exile. Uh, Napoleon, while the Congress of Vienna is still taking place, he escapes from uh, Elba and he, or Elba, I'm sorry, and he marches uh, on, uh, on Paris. The army is sent to capture him and the army comes to him and turns over and joins him. Uh, and so suddenly, because remember, he had been the one who had built up that army and they are loyal to Napoleon and he marches through Paris, and for a hundred days, Napoleon is supreme. It's only going to be a hundred days, uh, uh, just a little bit over three months. And in, uh, in just north of France, in Belgium, uh, at a, place, a little tiny village called Waterloo, Napoleon is met by a combined army of, of English under Wellington, and also the Prussians come and, and meet him. So there's uh, actually two armies that come up against him, and Napoleon is defeated. It's the epic battle that now decides the fate of Europe for the next hundred years. Uh, Napoleon uh, meeting his ultimate defeat at Waterloo. And from now on, he will be exiled. It won't be a, uh, an opposed, uh, a self imposed exile. He will now be exiled uh, to a tiny island uh, down in the South uh, Atlantic, just off the coast of, uh, of Southern South America, uh, down near. Um, uh, that uh, far, far down south, and he will eventually die down there. 
Now, the American response to all this, this is what taking, what's taking place in Europe. Meanwhile, um, the United States, and when I say America, excuse me for, I just couldn't fit United States in here. Uh, the United States has been taking a stance of neutrality. Uh, the Embargo Act in 1807 placed an embargo on products going to and from both England and France. Uh, and that was a harm that the, uh, American ports were specifically closed to British ships. Uh, although it was intentionally a embargo on French ships as well. Uh, now this is only the, uh, the United, remember the United States during this period uh, only occupies that eastern portion of the sea coast of, of what is what we think of as that country today. Um, and this embargo is quite damaging to American economy, especially to those northern states. And that means that you have really two responses to this uh, to this activity. Uh, those northern states are saying, well, we want trade. Let's let's have peace with England. Yes, we don't have to get involved in their war. Uh, whereas the southern states are very, uh, they're very pro-French and anti-English because remember the the, uh, the French had been on the side of the United States when those co uh, colonials were fighting for their independence. And so two very different responses uh, to to these actions. Um, the War of 1812 then, and that's a sort of a, a byproduct and a sideline that was relatively small conflict when compared to the greater wars that Napoleon was fighting uh, in Europe. Um, but England was providing the Indians, uh, uh, the American Indians with arms. And uh, there was also the issue of English impressment of American sailors. They would stop American ships and, and say, well, some of these uh, uh, sailors, yes, they're American now, but they were originally English, and so they're, Amer they're English citizens. So uh, we're going to take them to fight in our Navy, whether they want to or not. And this is going to lead to conflict. Now, uh, the United States has no standing army. They're very weak militarily. And their total Navy <laughs> consists of 16 ships, and they've got about 7,000 soldiers, um, as opposed to uh, England, remember England and France are the two uh, greatest military powers in the world at this time. So the War of 1812 then has uh, three major, if I can call them campaigns, I'm not sure if I had to, uh, to give them that big of a, uh, of a phrase. Uh, first, there's a campaign of battle on the Great Lakes, uh, which the uh, Americans uh, lose. Um, there is a conflict where the uh, British sail up the Potomac and they capture uh, Washington, D.C. and actually burn the capital to the ground. Uh, the president at that time is uh, is Madison, James Madison, and he and his wife, Dolly Madison, uh, have to flee uh, and as their home, the White House, is, is burned. Um, the, they continue on up and um, they fight a battle at Fort McHenry, at McHenry in Baltimore. Um, there's a poet that happens to be sort of a, an observer there, uh, Francis Scott Key, who writes a poem that is turned into a song and becomes eventually uh, the, na the American national anthem. Uh, and then finally, there's a, a third conflict down in New Orleans as the British uh, seek to invade there. Here, when the battle actually takes place, um, the peace had already been signed, but they didn't have internet back then. And so the war has been over for several weeks, but the news hasn't yet reached the United States. And so they don't realize it. Uh, the hero of that battle was uh, General Andrew Jackson. He's eventually going to be uh, a president of the United States.